Welcome to another episode of Art Heals All Wounds. I'm your host, Pam Uzel. On this show, we meet artists transforming lives with their work. About 10 years ago or so, an old friend and I met to catch up at Cafe Med on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley, California. I remember walking into Cafe Med and feeling like I had entered into a different country, maybe even a different time. It had this bright blue and white striped awning in front, and inside the ceiling was really, really high. High enough for there to be a second level to the cafe, sort of like a mezzanine that overlooked the ground level. A lot of history had happened at Cafe Med. Members of the free speech movement and the Black Panthers and lots of artists gathered there over the years. My friend and I were sitting at a table on the ground floor. Suddenly, a woman entered the cafe. She was older and, in my memory at least, She was wearing several articles of clothing made out of velvet, and she wore a hat that looked like something that could be worn at a Renaissance fair. She started approaching the tables in the cafe, asking people to buy a book. Berkeley in general, and especially Telegraph Avenue, was known for having its share of eccentric characters, and I didn't really think much about who this woman might be or what book she was selling. Suddenly, my friend is waving her over to our table. He takes out a $20 bill and buys one of her books and asks her to sign it. After she leaves our table, he hands me the book and he says, here, one day you'll be glad you have this. That was my first and only encounter with the poet Julia Vinograd. The book she was selling was a collection of her poetry called Beside Myself. Julia Vinograd was a longtime fixture on Telegraph Avenue starting back when the street was the complete epicenter of protest and political action in Berkeley. It might be hard to understand this if you haven't lived someplace like Berkeley, but when you're in a town that embraces misfits and eccentrics, you feel such an incredible sense of freedom because you can finally be your true self there and you can find your people there. Julia Vinograd had polio as a child, and she walked with a very distinctive limp. She definitely found her people on and around Telegraph Avenue, and eventually was named Poet Laureate of Berkeley. So much has changed in the Bay Area over the last few decades. One way or another, the unusual and even eccentric people seem to be disappearing. Even the beautiful Cafe Med closed its doors in 2016. Then, two years later, in 2018, Julia Vinograd passed away. A few weeks ago, I found out that a local filmmaker was making a film about Julia Vinograd and her work. Ken Paul Rosenthal is a documentary filmmaker who incorporates a lot of experimental techniques into his films. He realized that Vinograd needed to be remembered, yes, for her poetry, but also because of the unique time period she lived through and the way that her perspective put into words the life that she had lived with the other people who had struggled for their place in this very accepting street. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Listen and let us inspire you. People want me to write personal poetry about who I am. Well, who are you? Do you wash your underwear? Do you sign petitions? Do you litter? Do you love? What are your hands for? Do you feel cheated at unexpected moments as if you were stuck with the wrong life? Maybe mine? That was a short excerpt from Julia Vinograd's work called Personal Poem. A beautiful recording of her reading it is in Ken Paul Rosenthal's documentary, Julia Vinograd Between Spirit and Stone. Making a film about someone who's passed away is always tricky. Will there be enough archival footage? Especially if the person wasn't particularly famous. How do you bring that person to life? Especially someone like Vinograd who was an integral part of a place and time. From the sample of Ken's film I've seen, his approach is to create poetry with his images in a way that shows how Vinograd's presence and her poetry permeated the culture and the community that both inspired and sustained her. Hi Ken, thank you so much for being on this episode of Art Heals All Wounds. There are a lot of things I want to ask you about, about your film work, but before I do, can you tell everyone what you do? I make documentary films, and for many years they focused on the theme of mental health Mm. and first-person narratives around mental health. However, for the last three, I've shifted away from mental health and now focus on making films that explore the intersection of art, 
madness, and what I like to call the spectrum of difference. Mm. And what has been a primary focus of my mission all along now for many years has been uh, to help alleviate human suffering by cultivating beauty. I really privilege beauty. It's very, very important for me that the films, even though they may address dark subjects, that they be presented in a beautiful wrapper so that people feel feel like it's easier to sit with subjects that may be otherwise difficult to address if they were presented as dark in form as they may sound in content. Mm. That makes so much sense to hear you say that because I first became familiar with your work with your film Crooked Beauty, which is a really um, unique and unexpected portrayal of bipolar disorder. And the images were unbelievably beautiful, yet it didn't detract at all from what she was saying. And the impact on how on me of how I thought about both bipolar disorder and mental health was enormous from that film. Yeah, it was really important to me to not create an othered portrait. In other words, I didn't want to portray this person as being no more than about despair and damage. Mm. And when you show the person who's speaking, of course, there's an integrity to having the words come right out of their own mouth as they tell their own story. But having come from an experimental film background, I'm really, really interested in form as a conveyor of meaning. In experimental film, broadly speaking, often form is the meaning. Mm. The meaning is the form. So I was really sensitive to that going into my very first documentary film. So I decided that I wanted to use images and contexts from the natural world and from urban spaces to convey inner landscapes mm -hmm. of the speaking subject. So we hear the person's voice, but we see images which metaphorically embody what she is saying. Right. Uh, it, it's a stunning film, and I really urge anyone who's listening to look it up and find a way to see it. I'm sure they can contact you. You can see it for free. It's my only film that's online for free. Um, I toured with it for um, three and a half years, and I felt at some point it was time to just let go and let it do what it does best in the world, which is work as a tool for personal transformation. It's on Vimeo, so you mm. just simply have to look up Crooked Beauty on Vimeo, and you can see it there. That's so fantastic to hear that. One of the reasons I wanted to have you on today is that you're working on a new film called between Spirit and Stone? The, the entire title is Julia Vinograd, Between Spirit and Stone. Right. So I would love if you would talk about Julia Vinograd. How did you know about her? And why do you want to make a film about her? Why is it important yeah. to make a film about her? My relationship to Julia and the subject of the film goes back over 30 years. Mm. Uh, when I arrived in San Francisco in 1986, I actually took to the poetry scene prior to the film scene. And I mean, they happen pretty much uh, interdependently, but it was really the poetry scene that I jumped into wholeheartedly. And Julia held a court at a place called the Cafe Babar in Noe Valley. Um, it actually moved from Noe Valley to what is now an Irish pub at the corner of 21st and Guerrero. Mm -hmm. That's where the Cafe Babar formerly uh, was, was run. And it was post-beat and pre-poetry slam. <laughs> so it was a very small back room, smoke, corrugated walls, a lot of pounding on the corrugated walls that surrounded the small uh, room. I discovered Julia at the Café Babar, and I was moved more by her presence than her poetry. And as I got to know her and her work, there was one seminal collection of her poems called The Book of Jerusalem. And they were actually given to me by a roommate I had. I'd been living in a Jewish co-op mm -hmm. when I first arrived in San Francisco. So these poems were completely unlike anything else she wrote. Her poetry was largely known as street poetry. It was very observational. Mm -hmm. And it uh, basically spoke to and championed the lives of the itinerant subjects who lived in the Telegraph Avenue and People's Park neighborhoods in Berkeley. But these Book of Jerusalem poems were entirely different 
Each poem is a dialogue between an anthropomorphized God and Jerusalem. And in these poems, they have voices like people, but it's still God, whatever that is. And, and Jerusalem is still a city of stone, but they are antagonistic towards one another. They are mutually supportive. They comment a lot on humanity and the inhabitants mm. of, this, of, of Jerusalem. And they chilled my spine then. And I knew I had to make a film about them. And I approached her and proposed it. And I recorded her reading them in her apartment. And then I went to live on a kibbutz near Jerusalem for six months to glean images. Wow. My plan was simply to assemble the images and have her recordings of the poems over them. And that was it. Well, I was very young. I was 25. I was a young artist. I was a young man. And I really didn't do a very good job of it. But I, I, I sort of let go more than quit the project because I knew that I needed to find my voice as an artist. Right. And also just walk around the block as a human being a few more times, just have more life experience before I could really do justice. In other words, I needed to rise up to the level of the poems. Mm. And 30 years later, I have found my voice and I have been around the block more than a few times and I feel ready to do justice to them. So this, this film is the maturation of that early dream I had when I was 25. Right. Well, it's interesting because you have a sample cut and I watched that. And one thing that really moved me were the recordings of her reading her own work. And I wondered how you got that because Julia Vinograd has passed away. And it's often very rare to find that sort of material for an artist who has already passed away. You include two poems, I think, in your sample work. One is from the Jerusalem Collection. And the other one, I would say, is her observational poetry, which I found that one to be maybe the one that moved me the most of all, because that does go into this theme of the life around her there on Telegraph Avenue, which she certainly has covered the historical span of Telegraph Avenue from activism to, you know, when drugs, all kinds of different things have um, changed the avenue and even into the beginning of gentrification and really a huge rise in homelessness there. You also include images of things like her apartment. How did you get that material? Well, you know, Julia passed away in 2018. Yeah. And for someone who's so omnipresent, not only on the streets of Berkeley, but also at literally thousands of poetry readings over the course of her 50 plus career, um, actively reading her work, there's, there's just so few recordings of her. So to go back to the recordings of only what are excerpts in the work sample you saw, they were very, very poorly recorded. And, you know, it, it's kind of beautiful that the very best recordings of her reading any poems anywhere are the ones I made of her when I was 25 in her apartment with the Sony Pro Walkman. Wow. So often it's not the gear, it's just the way you use it. And I just held the mic very close to her and supported her reading them repeatedly, either faster or slower. And they're just amazing that 30 plus years, I knew exactly where to go in a box and I just pulled them right out. Right. So, you know, it's really great that I have those. In, in terms of other ways to present and embody her, there's virtually no interviews of her. Mm -hmm. There's just little to no moving footage of her. Mm -hmm. So what I need to do is, is, is create her corpus, her presence, by using anything I can get that's left over, all her ephemera, her letters, her typewriter, um, try and uh, reanimate her using words uh, like as, as visual, as a graphic element. Um, her words will not only create three-dimensional portraits of her, we're, we're going to have animation uh, convey her walking literally mm. off the covers of her books mm. from two-dimensional to becoming three-dimensional. It's also really important that her words exist in the spaces in which she lived mm. and wrote and tried to hawk her books. So it's for the interviews, for example, we're going to see the people over a black screen in a black box looking at the camera. But by leaving a black space around them, then certain quotes can appear on screen and literally slide off the frame and then into the places that she worked and lived and walked. So it could, the words can be moving down the sidewalk. 
and the words can be wrapping around telephone poles or inhabiting the spaces in between buildings. Mm -hmm. And I think in that way, her presence will become embodied and enlivened. Well, you bring up something else that I did want to comment on from the sample I saw is the work you're doing with typography and animation. I mean, typography usually involves animation, but what I did love is that you do have in your sample work words from her poem, but the way that you've shaded them does become this outline of her face. She had a very distinctive walk and you use different words at times, sort of in the shape of a footprint to convey how she moved through the town. You do have things in there, as you mentioned, snaking around telephone poles And you also incorporate the bubbles that she was known for. And I'm wondering if you would just explain a little bit more for someone who's never heard of her. Why was she known as the bubble lady? Yeah. Well, she had polio and she had epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And back during the free speech movement, uh, she was not able to participate the way a lot of her peers did, you know, in protests, conflicts with the National Guard and the police. And in the People Park protests in particular, one night she decided to show up in the park with a bag full of bubbles, bottles of bubbles. And she just started blowing them as a sign of um, kind of peaceful protest in that space, which the University of Berkeley had been trying to take over and they had fences up and and there was a lot of conflict in that space. Mm -hmm. So she was inhabiting it in a peaceful way. And a couple cops approached her and she charmed them by giving them their own bubbles <laughs> to blow. And they started having a contest to see which one could blow bigger bubbles. Oh. And she thought, well, if I could charm the cops, who else could I charm? Right. So it became her signature, it became her brand. And she would not only just charm kids, but she would charm adults. And all of the many protests that she attended over the year, be they be um, anti-apartheid or in support of AIDS research or pro-Palestinian rights. She wasn't really outwardly political so in, in her words and her writings so much as just her presence at, at these, these protests. And just her, the sign of creative activism became so synonymous with her that she became known as the bubble lady of Telegraph Avenue. Mm. Well, that's interesting. Like the way that you're describing her, it almost sounds the fact that she did a lot of observational poems, the fact that she was a fairly consistent fixture on Telegraph Avenue and at protests, it sort of makes her an observer of this entire period of history. And I'm really curious, you answer this, why it's important to make a film about her for you personally, but in a larger context, why should there be a film about Julia Vinograd? Well, you know, there's this great statement by Martin Luther King, human salvation lies in the hands of the creatively maladjusted. Mm. This is a film that highlights the creative potential that can emerge from difference and asks viewers to consider how difference is intrinsic to our humanity. So Julia had all these uh, conditions that really compromised um, her her wellness, but she pushed through in spite of them. She produced over seventy volumes of poetry, and you know she was raised in an upper middle class home with a father who was a Nobel Prize winning scientist wow. and a mother who was a poet and teacher in her own right and was published in the New Yorker. Yet she lived a consciously downwardly mobile lifestyle, and you know she wrote from the rare perspective of surviving on the same economic and cultural margins as the itinerant and disenfranchised subjects whose lives she chronicled Mm. in all those collections. It's not just a portrait of a poet whose poems I like, Mm -hmm. uh, even though I think they're phenomenal poems, particularly the Book of Jerusalem poems, but it's just someone who can thrive in spite of the challenges they have and just someone who was really close to voices that get marginalized. I mean, she was a champion for these voices. Mm -hmm. And I just think her story is is an example. It's not just the work she produced, but it's the context in which she did it. You know, I think it's just a day and age where people need examples of how we can thrive in spite of the challenges we face. Mm. Yeah. Well, 
and in your sample work, I'm going to go back to that again. You have a quote from one of the people that you interview that for Julia, she believed that each human being has within them the microcosm of all creation. What does she mean by that? <laughs> I can't tell you what she means. I can tell you what I okay, yes. think she means. But, you know, I feel that creativity and destruction are intertwined. You know, it's like the the classic symbol of the yin yang. And, you know, no one is all good or all bad. And, you know, however we may read, be read by another on the surface. And, you know, art, art needs conflict. It needs that interplay of, of opposites or, you know, lark, lightness and darkness. And I think that's what that quote is referring to. So those poems, you know, present that in a real, in a very, very large, large way, uh, those Book of Jerusalem poems. That's why the quote was presented in that work sample mm -hmm. in the context of the poems. Yeah, I, I don't want to get too esoteric here, but, but that's essentially it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's essentially it. I mean, I know there are moments in my life where I've had crippling anxiety attacks. Mm -hmm. And in that very, very moment when I really just, don't want to live anymore in that moment, right then, side by side with that, that impulse comes a creative one where all of a sudden I, I, I want to do is, is produce something. I want to make something creative. The desire to live is, is completely intertwined with the impulse to die. And I've experienced this so many times. It's always been the desire to make something. It's like, well, I've, at least I've got my film to live for. Mm. At least I've got that. But that all becomes really, really consecrated. Like I could say, I feel that all the time. You know, if not for the film, what else would there be? But in those moments when I feel the most acute, extreme despair, when that's happened over the course of my life, it's always been followed immediately by this desire to produce something, to create something art artistic. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I know my most delicious moments in my life are when I have just witnessed, experienced uh, art in some form. The medium doesn't matter. It could be a film, it could be a dance, it could be a poetry reading. And it sets something fluttering in my belly as if some, a life has just been inseminated. And then when I step out of the space in which I experience the art and I feel larger, I feel as if I've grown beyond the limits of my skin mm. and I feel connected to all things or to things greater than just my own, you know, lone self. Right. And, and art has that power, but it, it definitely, I think, often has to come from a place of lacking, a place of despair. I, I think, you know, art fills a, fills a void. Mm. It fills something we're hungry for that has not been satiated. And I think all art, is, that's fundamentally what all art does. So that's why the whole idea of beauty and, you know, working with these dark subjects that I have for the last 18 years or so in my work for a while it was specifically mental health narratives. Now their narratives more around, you know, difference. But it's just that it's, it's like a, a point of departure, you know, there, and, and it, beauty has to be at the core of it. I, I love the life of the mind. I love ideas. But... You know, I think so many documentaries out there now are about what's wrong in the world. Mm -hmm. And those films sh should be made. They need to be made, the reflection of these chaotic times. But there's also always been chaos, too. And I feel now, as the chaos arrives more and more on our doorstep in this, you know, digitized social media, increasingly virtual way we live our lives, social media informed, um, I feel that there needs to be something of an antidote to that. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the way we're addressing these, these dark issues in these dark times. So it's really important to me to reach the head through the heart with beauty as the gateway. I, beauty is something that's universal. And I don't even want to define what beauty is because it may sound very cliched, but I mean, I think we all know it. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that's why a lot of the soundstage for a lot of my work is, is the outer world. Because, you know, the, the kind of prevailing narrative for wellness is that it's all inside our heads and that there's this sort of uh, biological imperative to fix what we perceive as broken inside of us. But that brokenness is part of our humanity. Mm -hmm. 
And I think a lot of the wellness integration is happening already out in in the world, Mm. you know, in nature. I mean, nature doesn't cry over, you know, um, when when, when there's damage, it it starts regenerating right away. Mm. And I just, I love working in both natural and urban landscapes, but in the urban landscapes I work in, I'm still working with natural elements, Mm -hmm. you know, light and nature, fighting, you know, breaking through the concrete moving over the cement surfaces. And uh, I think it's possible to balance those elements with first person narratives in a way that is actually more enlivening than just seeing uh, seeing a character speak on screen. Mm-hmm. But with this film, I'm really taking a big leap in my filmmaking because I do have the interviewees on camera speaking. Um, I just wanted to make something that was a little bit more conventional, a little bit more mainstream in order to reach a broader audience. Mm -hmm. I will say, though, that even in your interviews on screen, you allow the subjects to look directly into the camera, which is not the normal mode, but it's a very different way of engaging whoever is looking back on the other side of the screen. And I really enjoyed that too. So even with your talking heads, you're approaching it a little bit um, creatively than what the normal path might be. Yeah. You know, if I may say quickly, I mean, the kind of the curse, the curse of, um, of having studied film formally is that you never see a film in the same way again. You can't separate the construction of it from that you can't completely suspend disbelief so especially in documentary nothing irks me more than seeing a person sitting in a chair looking off access at an unseen interviewer because you know the microphone is just there out of frame and you're seeing where all the lights are coming and often they're sitting in a place which gives context to who they are so if they're a scientist they're in their lab Mm -hmm. and if they're an artist they're in their studio and it just felt very, very contrived to me. And of course, most of the time, you're just so intrigued with what they're saying that you just, again, suspend disbelief and you don't question those things. But as a visual artist, I can't help but really obsess on those details. So I, I love the intimacy of having the uh, person look directly into the camera because, yeah, it's its own contrivance for sure. But it's also, you're looking right into the eyes of the person who's speaking to you as you normally would Mm -hmm. when you're having a conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, I will say that I think of all the filmmakers to make a film about poetry, I would probably pick you because I think... Of all the filmmakers. Well, of all the the ones. That's a lot. uh, Yes. (laughs) I I think, think though, that I'm going to stick with that answer because... Your visuals are so incredibly poetic, and I feel that care that you have for beauty in all of them, but also creating meaning. And you said earlier that this was a gateway to meaning was through the beauty. That makes so much sense when think when contextualizing your work and thinking about it. I do have one final question, and you have answered this in in certain ways, but I just want to ask it directly. The theme in your film about Julia Vinograd, Between Spirit and Stone, a lot of it has to do with artists who are differently abled, with people who are living on the streets. And I'm wondering what connects you with these sorts of issues? Why are you drawn to them? Because you've said that this is kind of a departure from working in mental health. You know, it's about how, again, does the idea of difference feed us? How can we thrive with it? How can we grow from it? So when I was involved with the mental health community, mental health was presented as a reflection of a social condition, not just as a biological one. And that really was interesting to me. It was all of a sudden the idea of madness was presented as uh, what I learned was a dangerous gift. Mm. So, you know, again, someone who who is struggling with their mental health, it's not about romanticizing in any way, but saying, well, if we if we can change the way we speak about it and see it as what does it offer us that if we had the right tools, the right mentorship, the right community around those issues, maybe we can ally ourselves with them. For example, do I have a, a obsessive compulsive disorder or am I just extremely meticulous and detail oriented? Mm-hmm. 
You know, mm-hmm. two different ways of looking at the same thing. Do I have ADD or am I just looking for a, a place where my intention can be better engaged? Mm. You know, so although now it's it's not about mental health issues per se, this idea of just being perceived by society as as lacking agency in some way, when how can you present, let's say the, the particular, in this case, in how can you present uh, someone like Julia Vinograd as having agency, as being empowered? But at the same time, it's an interesting conversation about, well, what, why has her work been unheralded up till now? So, you know, the film is about a lot of things. It's not just about her and her work, but it is about difference. It is about uh, disability. It is about People's Park and the legacy of, of uh, civic unrest and uh, resisting oppression and that legacy on today's climate of civic unrest. And then also it's again about ultimately beauty. I mean, the film, the arc the film takes, it starts with People's Park on the ground level, with the secular, moves into her work and the, the, her fellow Cafe Babar poets, which I feel is a really important chapter in mm. American literature that needs to be given its due. And then moves on to these Book of Jerusalem poems. So there's a kind of transcendence and even redemption that happens at the end. You know, I mentioned earlier about what I like to feel when I uh, feel uh, I've moved to a larger place when I witness great art. And I try and do that each of my films. You know, I want there to be a sense of uplift, a sense of redemption, a sense of becoming larger than the limits of your flesh. Mm. You know, I I think a good touchstone for this is I had a, a somatic therapist many years ago. And she spoke about how our bodies are like a glass. And if you imagine your relative madness as water pouring into this glass, at some point it's going to spill over the sides. So she said, well, the work that you and I are going to do is try and make your body bigger, your experience of it to be larger. So there's more room for your madness. Mm -hmm. It was very, very, very powerful. So it's not about being cured. It's about how can you live with your darkness, but create more space so you can work with it. So this is, in a sense, what I think all art has the capacity to do and, and what I try and do in my work. And mm-hmm. so, it, you know, there'll, there'll be politics, there'll be some darkness in there, but ultimately I want to take the viewer on a journey to transcend all of that and just have uh, you know, beauty be the maker, mm-hmm. not just change as the maker, but, but beauty as as the the transcendent element. Mm. Well, I'm going to ask you to let people know where they can find out more about you and also find out about the progress of this film, because I am really looking forward to you finishing it. Where can people find out more about you and your work, Ken? Well, a- as of this conversation, the primary place is my website, which is simply kenpaulrosenthal.com. And then on the film page, the Julia Vinograd film is the very first one at the top. Okay. And there's links there to um, an interview, mm-hmm. another interview, which discusses the film. And there's a donation link. And uh, hopefully very soon, there'll also be a dedicated film website. I think the best place to start is simply just to go to my personal website. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This has been such a lovely conversation to have with you today. Thank you very much. It was an honor. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Remember to be in touch on my Facebook page, Art Heals All Wounds, and also on Twitter and Instagram at Art Heals Podcast. I'm so grateful to Ken Paul Rosenthal for being on the show today. If you want to find out more about Ken and his work, visit his website, kenpaulrosenthal.com. That's K-E-N-P-A-U-L-R-O-S-E-N-T-H-A-L.com. He also has a website for the film. So to see more about it, including a short sample, go to www.betweenspiritandstonethefilm.com. 
The music you've heard in this podcast is Yellow Light District and Otto Waschenlage Instrumental by Lobo Loco. Beethoven's Piano Sonata No. 15 in D Major was performed by Karina Galanian. Thanks so much for listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed it, please follow it on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts.